we need all the help we can get because we're a two-man band, so feel free to clap and stomp and... I wandered so aimless, life fell a sin I wouldn't let my dear savior in Then came the sunrise, stranger in the night Praise the Lord, I saw the light I wandered so aimless, life fell a sin I wouldn't let my dear savior in Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night Praise the Lord, I saw the light I saw the light, I saw the light No more darkness, no more night Now I'm so happy, no soul inside Praise the Lord, I saw the light I walked in darkness and clouds covered me I had no idea where the way out could be the sunrise and pulled back the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy in my soul inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. And just like a blind man, I wandered alone Worries and fears I claim for my own Then like a blind man Do God get back your sight Praise the Lord I saw the light I saw the light I saw the light No more darkness No more night Now I'm so happy I'm so covered me I had no idea where the way out could be then came the sunrise and broke back the night praise the Lord I saw the light I saw the light I saw the light no more darkness no more night now I'm so happy no so Blind man, I wandered alone. Worries and fears I claim for my own. Then, like a blind man, God gave back his sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Just like a blind man, I wandered alone. Worries and fears I claim for my own. Then, like a blind man, God gave back his sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light No more darkness, no more night Now I'm so happy, I'm so inside Praise the Lord, I saw the light I saw the light, I saw the light No more darkness, no more night Now I'm so happy, I'm so inside Praise 
this God You're the one who calls me on You are the life, you are the life that's in my soul
Father, we thank you that you chose to send your son, Jesus Christ, at an appointed time, that you had set by your own timing, that you had set, that you had orchestrated all the calendar months to line up with your timing. And in your appointed time, you came yourself, Emmanuel, God is with us, and you showed us what it would be like to live a life fully yielded through the Holy Spirit to God the Father and the power of His words as life. And then you paid a price that no man could pay. And by your grace and by your goodness, you judged all of darkness for eternity. And through that judgment, you carried our sin and our iniquities. 
You carried everything that dark has caused damage to. Our poverty, our affliction, our separation. And through what you carried, even unto death, you rose with us in new life. That no longer will we be condemned or judged by our sins before our holy God. Because of the blood of Jesus. Because your grace extended in the hand of mercy. To lift us up to a place of life in resurrection power. And Lord, we celebrate the beginning of a new year in you. We celebrate your timing and acknowledge the timing of our mighty God. We take every prophetic word that is yet to be fulfilled and say, Lord, do it even as you've said it. We thank you that the seasons are drawing near when the fullness of your timing will come into reality. We thank you for the feasts that have already been established in Jesus Christ. And Lord, we acknowledge there are three to come. Lord, would you do it even as you've done it? We declare your greatness this evening and we declare that this is a holy time that you will meet supernaturally with your people. Lord, we declare we have access to you by the blood of Jesus. But there is something that you do in these appointed times to come in and change the affairs and the hearts of men and women. And Lord, I pray for these next 10 days that that is what you would do. The so-called times of awe would be a time of awesomeness in our Jesus. That this would be a time where you would release supernatural power. That you would release your grace and your goodness in signs, wonders and miracles in a way that would cause hearts to turn to you. Lord, we declare that even as darkness rises, so there is a new moon arising. Lord, out of darkness comes the light into fullness in its manifestation. And Lord, we declare your goodness and your greatness in your glorious light. And Lord, we take every blessing that you want to release into this year. We thank you for the year 5775 that has come. We thank you for the year that 5774 that was. A door that opened to a greater access to you. And we declare the Son of Songs that Lord, you are coming after your bride. You are at the door and you're about to put your hand through the hole of the door and come on in. And Lord, we say, come in this year. Come in to us in a whole new way. Lord, we declare a new season in you. The old has completely gone. Where we have gone astray, forgive us, Lord. But our hearts are turned back to you. Lord, where we've made a mess of things, we know your grace and forgiveness covers us. We ask, Lord, that this would be a year of fully embracing you like never before. That you may have the glory like never before. Lord, possess your bride like never before. We long for you. We desire for you so that you may be seen and that you may be known. We celebrate you, Lord, that this is a time of your making, of your visitation to those hearts that yearn for you, Lord. Lord, we have a hope and a faith expectation for the days and the year ahead that will look very, very different from where we've been. We know that we have every promise and every blessing in Christ Jesus. And we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, they all said, Amen. Please take your seats. If we can sit in the curved seats rather than the straight seats, that'd be great. If we could just come forward. Thank you. We were trying to do the cinema thing with the bollards, but people snuck around the other side because there were no ushers. So if we could just bunch up together, that would be wonderful. Thank you. We just spoke about the year that was in rebellion. Come on.
Bunch up together. We're all family. Let's take a seat, Josh. Joel. I could be a little while. It's great to see everyone, isn't it? Are you excited for this season? Are you excited for what God's going to do in this season? Anyone else? (laughs) I'm very, very excited. And uh, I don't normally wear a tallit. That's what that is, if you don't know. It suits me? Okay. Um, Now, I've taught on this tallit before, but we, we know there's healing in his kanaf, his wings. Go back into the teaching log and you'll find a whole teaching about that. We didn't have video then, so it was pretty boring, but it's quite amazing what this tallit represents and its dynamics. But you know, Jesus never had a tallit. This came in after Jesus, but he had something like this, and that was his one-piece robe. So when that woman reached through the crowd to lay hold of the healing in his wings, she touched the hem of his garment. And he was fulfillment. He was the living word. There are What this represents, the zitzes and the knots represent the 613 mitzvot, or commands we call them. But, but really they're teachings. Commands are teachings that we may have life. And 613 of these commands, these mitzvot, were reduced to 10 on Mount Sinai and a covenant of marriage made between Israel and God. Ten commands, five addressing the relationship with God, five addressing the relationship with one another. And it was all about love. Because Jesus came in the fulfillment of all of that. He is the fulfillment of everything that was spoken of. And he came in the fulfillment of that and he said, don't think I've come to do away with the law. I've come to fulfill it, to put it in its right place that you may have life. In Jesus, we have life. And he said, the law and the prophets, everything in the Tanakh, Old Testament, comes down to this. Love God with everything you have and then love one another. And this, Paul was later teach, would fulfill every righteous requirement of 613 mitzvot. The strategy was always Jesus. Everything we're doing tonight points to Jesus. Everything I'm going to say tonight, the teaching points to Jesus. Everything points to Jesus. And then you start to understand that while we languish still waiting for a Messiah, for one that's come, we are living in less than what God intended. We're living in a lesser revelation and the fullness of the revelation, which is and who is Jesus Christ. So you okay if I wear my tallit? I'm I'm feeling wrapped in God's word tonight. You know, on the back, there's some Hebrew writing, isn't there? Can you see that on the back? That's the blessing I'm living under as I preach the word. I'm going to hold the healing of his wings in my hands, even as I preach. You see, that's how the, the rabbis would walk around. They would tie that around. Their hands, they'd be so bound to the Word of God for them to do anything wrong. They had to unravel themselves from the Word to touch anything and do wrong. See, what was external in the Old Testament is now given to us by the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. You're wrapped in Jesus. That's why Paul says, put on Christ. Put Him on and wrap yourself in Him. And you know what? When I put on Christ under the blessing of God, you no longer see me, but you see Jesus. That's the whole idea of what Paul is saying when he says, put off the old way, put on a new way and hide yourself in Christ. That Jesus may be revealed through your life. You become the incarnation of the word of God. Isn't that a different way of seeing it? Wow. I've got some announcements I need to make. (laughs) Sort of seems a bit... Can I do them at the end? All right. I want to teach you a little bit if I can. So you don't have to open your Bibles, but I'm going to talk a little bit. I want to talk about the feasts. I want to talk about 
God's appointed times. And I've talked about them before, but it's good to remind ourselves that the feasts are the law, are God's appointed times. They're God's feasts, not man's feasts. They are feasts and celebrations, appointed time God has fixed by Scripture in the Old Testament to set up a heart encounter and a reality and a visitation into the circumstances of his people, his covenant people. And so God had to do something really, really interesting. The Talmud, which is rabbinical teaching, believes that the first month in which everything took place in Genesis, in the seven days of creation, notice the number seven, was in the month of Tishri. And that calendar continued until the Exodus. And then God commanded Moses. And he said, I'm going to change history and I'm going to change the months of the year. No longer will Tishri be the first month. Nisan will now be the first month. And then he set everything, everything, in heaven and in earth by that time clock. And then spoke to Moses and said, these shall be the feasts in Numbers and Leviticus if we want to go and find them. And we know that Jesus came and he spoke during the appointed times. Some of the most profound teaching of Jesus, the key teaching was at the appointed times. And we know that he became the Passover lamb. And sure enough, it was at the feast of Passover that he was sacrificed, thereby fulfilling the fullness of the Passover feast. See, the Passover feast pointed to Jesus. Then Jesus died and he took all sin. The next feast was fulfilled. And then he rose and became the first fruits in heaven. The next feast being fulfilled. And then he rose into heaven. And as he rose in, he touched the mercy seat in heaven. A shadow and an imperfect copy of which was on earth. As an example and a representation of that which was already in heaven. And as he rose up as the true priest of a new order. He touched the mercy seat with his blood. That forgiveness would forever flow for anyone who would believe upon him. The blood of Jesus touched the mercy seat. And then in the establishment and the evidence that he had risen and touched the mercy seat. In the fulfillment of the promises of God. He sent God in the Holy Spirit. The Father sent the Holy Spirit. Didn't he promise that? Didn't he say that another one just like me would come? Just I would send another one just like me. I'm going to stay in heaven as the king and true prince and ruler over heaven and earth. And the Holy Spirit's going to come and give a new creation. It's going to start creation again for those who believe. And they're going to be restored to a position just like Adam did when he walked in the garden before the fall. My goodness me. And as he sent the Holy Spirit, the Feast of Weeks was fulfilled. Pentecost. Seven weeks after the Day of Atonement. Sorry, after the, what is it quickly, Rabbi? Unleavened Bread. The unleavened bread is when Jesus goes into the ground. But there's a resurrection that the church needs to understand. And we live in the time of the last spring feast of Pentecost. And we are in between the times. This is called the church age because the church was born out of that resurrection power. And the age that we are fast approaching from an end time perspective is the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah. 
We celebrate Rosh Hashanah yearly as the head of the year. Interestingly, it's in Tishri, one Tishri. No other feast celebrates until the moon is full. But the new moon at the head of the month comes just with a slice of light in darkness. Oh my goodness, if you're getting this picture. Because there's a time coming from an eschatological or end time view where darkness is going to rise. It's promised. But there's something else that's promised. A greater light will emerge. Both darkness and light will rise together. And this is not a time to waver between opinions. This is not an hour to shrink back. This is an hour to embrace the timing of God for your life, even as we celebrate a new year. Even as we move out of a year of positioning, year 5774, speaking of an open door, we move into a fulfillment. We move into a running game with our parents. We are moving into a time where we need to understand the awesomeness of God again. Where we need to walk as Jesus walked with that seventh spirit of the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Not in a fearful way, but in a holy and righteous way. Because darkness is on the rise, but holiness will rise even greater. And here's the good news as we talk about these feasts. You are already holy in Christ Jesus. You are not trying to become holy. You're trying to become who you really are before God. You see, you've already been declared and made holy and righteous before God. And it wasn't anything to do with you except that you chose to put your trust in one king who died as a suffering servant on our behalf. Not just that he would take away our sin and bring reconciliation to the Father, but that he would give us full, overflowing, abundant life, eternal life that embraced every promise that was given to Israel, that embraced everything of blessing. For Paul says... All the promises in Christ Jesus are yes, and so let them be established. But there is a nation called Israel that still finds itself separated by a dividing wall because it hasn't yet embraced Jesus. And we need to understand that Paul has a particular view about how we're to approach all of these feasts and all of these timings of God. And in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, speaking to the church, he says this, Clean out the old yeast so that you may be a new batch, as you are unleavened. Leaven speaks of something small that goes through something. It can mean the leaven of the Pharisees. It can mean the leaven of Herod. And in this case, it means sin. Sin is basically unbelief. That's the root of sin. And the root of sin is iniquity and unbelief working together. But he says, no longer are you leavened. You are unleavened. You are righteous and holy. So live according to who you really are before God. Because of the covenant of Jesus Christ. For our Paschal Lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, Paul says something else that at first blush seems contradictory unless we understand what's going on. He says in Colossians 2, verse 16, Therefore do not let anyone condemn you 
in matters of food or drink or of observing festivals, new moons or Sabbaths. These are only a shadow of what is to come. But the substance of things belongs to Christ. What's he saying? You get a choice about the festivals and how you celebrate them. But if you are going to celebrate them, do it with honor. Do it with respect. Do it with the purity that's to be intended. Not to try and become righteous, but because you're already righteous and you're honoring God. But if you choose not to have the feast, then it's okay as well. Because this is what Paul says in Romans. Romans 14, verse 5. Some will judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. He's talking the difference of the dispute that was going on at the church of Rome. The Christians and those who wanted to hold to the Sabbath. And those who said, no, no, we resurrect. We are resurrected people. We hold to the Sunday as the day in which we should meet, the first day of the week. And some said, no, no, we should hold the meetings on a Saturday, on the Friday, Saturday, to continue to honor the Sabbath. And Paul says, it's not about that. It's about your heart towards God. You see, even under the law, it was about your heart towards God. It wasn't about the rules. The covenant of Abraham was based in faith and continued even while the covenant of Moses continued. God's great desire that he would find a men and women that loved him so much that they would live by faith. And he organized timing and feasts in a way that would have a whole heart commitment to what they were doing, to understand the majesty, the greatness and the kingship of who it was that was the ruler of the universe. Nothing, nothing is outside of the hold of the resurrected Jesus Christ in glory. Nothing is greater. No one is greater than Him. And God had the loving audacity to take you and I by virtue of His goodness and place our lives in Him, seated in a place of authority to rule and reign over every spiritual force that life may be given to the earth. See, these feasts in their timing towards fulfillment carry significance that I don't believe we should lose sight of, that we should have an understanding of. At the very least, if we're going to do it, let's honor it. We don't have to do it, but if we're going to do it, then let's give honor. This is what Paul goes on to say. Some will judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in the honor of the Lord. And those who eat, eat in the honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God, while those who abstain in honor of the Lord give thanks to the Lord. Whether you choose to participate or abstain, you are free to in Christ Jesus. But if we're going to do it, let's give glory to God. Amen? So, all of the Old Testament teaching, if I were to teach this, I could, you'd be hungry. That lamb would be burnt. We wouldn't eat the fish that's down there or the honey cake. You'd be yawning and going, wow, that's too much for us today. Give us real food. But I just want to say a few things. This is a time where we need to understand what we're doing. We need to understand how important this celebration really is. Not only to the Jewish community, but as a Messianic Jew and as a new community of God. That there is a witness in what we do and what we honor. And we've been pretty slow to honor these things, but this is the root to which we're attached. We are grafted into a history of promises and covenants. Now, some of those covenant promises look different for Israel than they do for the church. For the church, everything is yes and amen. 
That's settled in God's heart. And Paul says this about the grafting in. Ironically, in Romans 11, 11, the number 11, 11, when it's doubled, is resurrection power. Romans 11, 11, resurrection power. Let's have a read. So I ask, have they stumbled, speaking of Israel, so far as to fall by no means exclamation mark. But through their stumbling, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So as to make Israel jealous. The way we live our salvation, the way we honor God, the way we walk in His heart and fully embrace Him should make every Jew jealous because of the blessing, because of the power, because of the reality of the kingdom of God resting on, in, and through our lives. You see, what is going to draw Israel to God is the church. Paul says so. Now, if their stumbling means riches for the world, and if their defeat means riches for Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Verse 25, So that you may not claim to be wiser than you are, brothers and sisters, I want you to understand this mystery. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. Come on, church. We need to make Israel jealous. As it is written, out of Zion will come the deliverer. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards of election, they are beloved for the sake of their ancestors, for the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. When God made a covenant with Israel, Although he produced a fulfillment and a greater covenant, he never forgot his promises to the nation. And he put the church in a better position than even Israel. That somehow our lives revealing Jesus would bring them the revelation. And when the fullness of God's purposes has been achieved, there will be a mighty flood. There will be a mighty flood of those who don't yet see Jesus coming to Jesus. And we will be the witness that you will know. And there is a time that comes before that great time. And it is the sounding of the trumpets of Rosh Hashanah being fulfilled. The Bible speaks of a time in 1 Thessalonians where the church will be caught up into Christ, into the cloud of His glory. And there is a teaching, a popular teaching, that says the church will be lifted off as God deals with Israel. I take a different view. I don't think the church is going anywhere. If its assignment is to make the Jew jealous, it has to live at a time where it's so caught up into Jesus, they see the reality of the thing they've longed for. The world is crying out to see the reality of the coming Messiah. Israel saw him come and they saw him go with hardness of heart that the church may be established. But then there comes a time through the church that Israel may be grafted back in. Come on. And then there will be one new 
man. You see, Rosh Hashanah, the sounding of the trumpets or the feast of trumpets, is all about celebrating that which is coming. Recognizing God, the King. There are three benedictions which we're going to go to. And those benedictions speak of the majesty, they speak of the covenant, and they speak of the sounds. And what is incredibly important for us to understand is in the time clock of God, we must see where we're positioned. So that every time and every year we celebrate this moment, we know we are drawing greater, closer to the great conclusion. Generation to generation, increase to increase, glory to glory. The seven feasts are crucial in the understanding. But our celebration tonight is built around something that's very, very important. When the trumpets are mentioned in Scripture, it sounds an alarm. It really has two meanings. You can have two kinds of trumpets in Scripture. One is the shofar and the other is the silver trumpet in Numbers. You know that one like Jeff Jansen blows. And the Lord told him to get one of those. And those sounds carry a frequency that calls out to the people of God to come to a divine appointment with God. It's a sound that God has chosen that He will call His people to Him through. When Jesus comes, there will be a great sound of the trumpets. You will not be able to miss it. You will not be able to miss His coming. And although Scripture is clear and cannot be violated, that we do not know the time and the day we can position ourselves for a season. And the way we position ourselves in that season is to keep ourselves full of Him. Isn't that what Jesus taught? Being a wise virgin? Something about wisdom in this hour. That's really important as we celebrate 5775. When the trumpets are sounded, the common thought is in Jewish tradition is that the books will be open. And of course, this is foreshadowed in the yearly celebration of Rosh Hashanah. That there is an idea in our hearts that we should repent of anything that has caused us to stumble or caused our neighbor to stumble during the last year. Because the books that are open are the books that who has a righteous account before God will be blessed. And those who don't have a righteous account under the law Remember, I've foreshadowed all this through Jesus, so understand it. There would be a judgment. And this is how somber yet liberating this is. If you've lived righteously, you celebrate that your righteousness has been revealed before God. And here's the deal. You get to live another year. But if your name happens to be in that naughty book, the unrighteous book, then it said, God determines whether you live or die in that following year. I thank Jesus every day for the blood. I thank Jesus every day for the blood because there's only my name written in the book of the righteous. So you can see these 10 days, why they call them with Yom Kippur, which is the next feast that follows on. Then the Feast of Tabernacles, that 10 day, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, are the highest regarded feasts in the calendar. Where are you positioned with Jesus now? You have the assurance of your salvation. Isn't that something to celebrate? 
Isn't that something amazing? You see, on our behalf, Jesus has already fulfilled that very thing. In fact, prophetically, on our behalf, every single one of the seven feasts are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Our sins have been forgiven and we've been filled with the Holy Spirit. When Jesus spoke about the Holy Spirit, it was during the Feast of Tabernacles or the Booths. And he said in John that streams of living water would flow out of your belly. That which was foreshadowed in the desert was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. The fire and the cloud that led Israel, the cloud, the betrothal cloud that they were baptized into, became the reality of the Holy Spirit that lives within you, the fullness of the Godhead living in you. That's why Paul says the substance of all of this is Jesus. We sound the trumpets to awaken because the Lord has called us. We sound the trumpets to know the timings of God. We sound the trumpets at the time of the new moon. Psalm 81 says, Blow the trumpet at the time of the new moon, at the full moon and our solemn feast day, for this is a statute of Israel, a law of God of Jacob. Tishri 1 is right now, first day of Tishri. The next 10 days are known as the days of awe. For us, they're the days of awesomeness of God. You know why? Because if we're in Christ Jesus, we've got nothing to fear. If you don't know Jesus tonight, let me tell you there's a very good opportunity right here and now. Because the only book that will be open on your day will find you in the book of life. Then God will turn in Jesus Christ to open the second book. And the second book is not your unrighteousness. It's what you did with your righteousness or your good works. And there you'll give an account before the throne of heaven what you did with your life, what you did with God's grace, what you did with what he gave you. Because the scripture says that everything, everything belongs to Jesus, belongs to God. Everything on this earth and everything in it belongs to God. He's the owner, the rightful owner, the legal owner. And you know the amazing thing? He creates us heirs not of this world, but of his world. The place we have legal entitlement is in heaven. And the release of that legal entitlement by faith because of his grace is based on my stewardship of what he's given me on earth. And that stewardship doesn't go unnoticed. When we stand before him and the book is opened, he's come again for his bride. We know we're going to be saved. But do we know our reward? That's the challenge as we come to the close of the ages. What have we done with the salvation that we've been given? Let the trumpets sound. Let the books be opened. Let's know the blessing of God. Let's know the awesomeness of God. Let's know who it really is that we've been joined to. And that's what they do. They, In the ceremony, they start with Micah 7, verse 18 to 20. Who is a God like you? It's a good place to start, isn't it? You can't contain him. He's better than you think. And every thought you had about him is incorrect. No matter how big, no matter how amazing, he's bigger and he's more amazing. No matter what you think he can do, he can do more. 
you cannot contain God and the goodness of God and the awesomeness of God to our mind. That's why we've got to say you are beyond us in every measure. You're beyond us, Lord. Who is a God like you? Pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression of the remnant of your possession. He does not retain anger forever because he delights in showing mercy. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread out iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depth of the sea. It was not uncommon for Rosh Hashanah to be celebrated by water where the action would be of the past sins of the year to be cast upon the waters, to be cast off the restraint of the bondage of sin. But you see, Micah is a fulfillment of Jesus Christ. Do you see how privileged we are? There is a nation longing for what we have. Yet they ask for a divine encounter when the divine ones encountered us. Psalm 118 verse 5, they go out and they say, Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me in a spacious and broad place. This is a year of spaciousness. This is a year of spaciousness. And when God speaks of spaciousness, He speaks of fat and cream. Provision. It's a year of provision. And the Lord answered me and set me in a spacious and broad place. With the Lord on my side, I do not fear. What can mortals do to me? The Lord is on my side to help me. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in mortals. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. There's a greater system. It's called heaven. Heaven conquers everything on earth. It's greater. And then they read Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, would mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in His word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. There is an eager anticipation of the coming of the Messiah. There is a nation still looking for the one we found. And when He comes again, when He comes again, you and I will have what we've been investing in, in the fullness of our hope and faith. Friends, this is a year of God letting us know He's coming in. He's coming in. He's opening the door. Early this year, I was with Bobby Connor and Paul Keith Davis and a few other prophets. And the Lord showed me that we're on a threshold. And the church is standing at a threshold, but the door is closed. And this is not a door where Jesus just comes in. There is no way we can let Him in. There is no keyhole outside. In other words, it is a sovereign timing of God where He is about to step in to His church. He's just looking for a people that desire Him to step in. He's just looking for a people. We celebrate that. We celebrate that this evening. We celebrate that this year. And we say, Lord, as we sound the trumpets, do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Open the door of heaven and let it rain. Let the awesomeness of God be established on earth just as He is in heaven. 
There is blessing this year. There is favor this year. There is fat and there is cream. You can't handle what God's going to do for you this year because you've positioned your heart all of last year. And they finish with Isaiah 11, 9. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountains for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is a new year. We don't do things this year that tripped us up last year. We count the blessings. We count the favor. We recognize our King. We see that He is good, that He's quick to forgive. We don't carry grudges and we don't carry hurts. We carry the glory of God to make a people jealous because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. The honey we're going to have tonight is really, really important. Everything is covered with honey. And it means the sweetness of the new year. Carrots, we're going to have. It represents gazar. And the word gazar, the Hebrew word for decree. The sweetness of God as we eat the carrots. It's like we're going to decree. What does Job say? Decree a matter and it shall be established. We're going to eat the beets or spinach. And the word is selek. Is that right? Selek. And it's similar to the word for remove. And we eat them to express the hope that our enemies will be removed. And black eyed peas, it's not a band. <laughs> or green beans. Rubia, referring to several different types of small beans, is reminiscent of the word to increase. So you eat the peas to increase. And then the fish head. Now, what, did, what, is, what does every covenant Jew understand? That they are the head and not the... So we don't eat the tail, but we get to eat the head. Now, the best part is the cheek, I'm told. You can have my bit. And then we have dates. But I just want to commend Jesus to you tonight. What an amazing opportunity for us to celebrate. Don't you think? We've never done this before. But there's something in the holiness of God that says, let's understand his time clock. Let's start to understand what God's up to and why he does things. That we may gain the wisdom of God so that His glory may cover the earth. Amen? Let me pray for you. And we're going to go and eat. And then we're going to have a procession, like a nice little army, on the parade ground, following behind our rabbinical man, Dugan. Does everyone know Dugan? Amen. Amen. Um, Dugami is a Messianic rabbi, correct? And uh, what a wonderful privilege. He's been teaching me about a whole lot of things. We, we can go deeper in this, but I'm not going to. Um, but he has a wealth of, wealth of, wealth of knowledge around all of these things. And um, I'm very excited that he's with us in this season. There's, I tell you, God's Jehovah sneaky at the moment. And I don't know exactly what's going on, but something's going on. So we're going to follow him down, but I'm going to pray for you. Father, I thank you. We don't know the half of it, but we want to learn. We want to learn. Because there's a whole lot more about you we just have no clue about. And every time we look at you, you show us another facet of who you are. You show us another dimension of your greatness, your goodness, 
your love, your grace, your power, your authority. Lord, I just pray that we be overwhelmed by you. That you would step into your body. That this would be the season where these next 10 days you turn everything upside down. That we would see the awesomeness of God. That our focus would utterly shift to you. Off of every situation, no matter how dire. We will just start to know you in every situation. And Lord, I thank you for the blessing that comes when you come. I thank you for the promises we already have, but I thank you for the increase of favor to exist on everyone's life. I thank you that you are opening a door of fat and cream. Lord, establish it, smear us, fill us, cover us with the honey of heaven, with the fat and the cream of your provision, your anointing, your wisdom, your power, your authority. We put away and cast off everything of the last year. And we come cleanly, boldly, and willingly into a new year. We are waiting for you like the morning sun. Even as the psalmist said, we are waiting for you not because you haven't redeemed us, because we want to encounter you and know you in even greater measure like never before. We long to know you, that we may reveal you, that we may become the incarnation of the living God, because as you are, we are in this world. We thank you for your timing. We thank you for your blessing. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. And Holy Spirit, we thank you for the life of Jesus. And we declare that you are God in our life and God in this church. You are God to the world. And we give you honor and we give you praise. Even as we celebrate, let our hearts be filled with you. Bless the food that's been prepared. Let it be eaten with honor and thanks that you would be glorified. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll bless you.